Welcome to the Fred Hinton Show. This is Fred Hinton. I am at City Hall. Today's guest is Wenge Newt Newton. He is District 7 City Council. Welcome to the Fred Hinton Show. Woo woo! Woo woo! <laughs> Oh, thank you, City Councilman, for taking this time out and allowing me to come have words with you about some things that are going on in the city of St. Petersburg. Um, let's get into our interview here. One of the things that I want to talk about is the crime in St. Pete and what is the plan for the crime in St. Pete. Some of the things that I have heard by talking to some people, some St. Pete natives, is they're scared to come outside. They're scared to allow their kids to be outside. What are some of the plans that the city has to uh, coattail some of that crime? Well, first of all, um, that would be an administrative task or an administrative duty when it defaults to the mayor. The people got to understand what council actually does. We're really the keeper of the coins. We control the money as far as the uh, approval of spending and stuff like that. When you talk about administration, employees, uh, police, fire, that, all that falls up under the Hospice of under the mayor, the strong mayor form of government is what's, what we have. However, we do go and advocate and uh, bring these concerns forward. We have a quarterly uh, update from the police chief and the fire chief, at which time we go down those specific things that you're talking about. How many homicides? How much crime? You know, what are you doing? And, and they pretty much give us an update. I can tell you uh, unequivocally the, the, the uh, report from City Hall or from the mayor's side is that crime is down, you know, if you look over 10 years, well, he's only been in office three and a half years, so if you go back 10 years, um, you got to go back that far to get them to tell you this crime is down. Also, how much crime is not being reported? And it's really how you feel, how safe you feel, where you live uh, in this city. So as it pertains to crime, um, I, I would tell you that it's uh, a, lot of, a lot of crime is probably not being reported, so the numbers that you've seen. It's probably worse than what it really is. Okay, so the city is aware of what's going on, and they do have a plan of action. Well, I don't understand what the plan of action is. What the mayor has done about his power again is he uh, spent the chase policy. So now you got police officers flying at high rates of speeds throughout the neighborhood in my district and everywhere else, which is not safe for the constituency or the, or the, or the children that might be playing in those areas. Uh, but the hospitals are, are catching these guys that are doing crime. I can tell you that um, you have a, a lot of things that attribute to it. When you have an area where you have a high unemployment rate, you know, it's usually double among African Americans. And uh, you also have an area where you have a lot of uh, drug activity, open air drug dealing and, and, and uh, stuff like that. All that we got the crime, we got the problem. So it needs to be something that's put in place to try to curtail that. That also leads into my, one of my next question is jobs. Is there any type of jobs coming to the St. Pete area? Is there, you know? Well, it's, it's difficult. You know, we, we've been fighting and advocating for that for as long as we have a priority hiring ordinance that's been tied up for over two and a half years that was supposed to uh, help hire uh, on city contract, which is your tax dollars and mine, uh, spending supposed to require or mandate, they don't like the word mandate, uh, but require them to hire so many um, um, hard to hire people people with backgrounds, uh, and, to, and also to let, say, 50% of the, the workable hours be uh, given to people that live in the city or in the county here. So you okay. have a lot of people coming in and bringing their own crews, and you see jobs, and then it's, you can't get a job, and then the work is gone. So a lot of that's been going on. Uh, that that uh, ordinance, once it is passed, will kind of curtail that. Uh, I kind of hate it. You got weighted down by administration. They don't want to do the mandated part. They want to do the incentivized part. So if you hire enough uh, minorities or hard to hire people or, uh, and, and people that live here in St. Pete, then we'll pay you quick or something like that. They incentivize them, you know. But the problem I have with it is that a lot of people say there's no problem with the way they're doing things. They should be mandated to do it. I say fully because we are spending millions, hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars and the way I look at it is you have enough uh, income and resources within your city to be able to provide for the people that live here. And you have to be able to do that for us jobs and housing opportunities. But if you're allowing the money to, to, to leave the area and the people not to get work, then then what are you doing? You know what I mean? If we have a, a, a someone to come in to, build a, a, to rebuild a bridge or whatever, and we don't hire local labor, 
what happens is that money we spend to build that bridge, as soon as the bridge is done, leaves the area. But if you hire local labor, local contractors, some of that money, if not all that money, will stay in the area and it will be turned over seven or eight times where it really would infuse the economy or your local economy. People going out to eat, people going to shop, uh, people going to movies and visiting our, 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 our raised ball games or whatever. And that money will get turned over multiple times, creating additional jobs. So it has, the, it has the multiplier effect if you have those opportunities. But a lot of people don't see it that way. They want to be able to just take the money and run when they're done. So what is the citizens, the citizens of St. Pete, what can they do to help hotel the crime? And what can they do to help this ordinance pass? Well, the, I think the ordinance probably would be the key to it. Or it's the ones that are doing crime. I can tell you unequivocally, you can have jobs, all the jobs you want. They don't want to work, but they want to be lazy and get quick, fast drug money. That's what they're going to attempt to do. But like I say, when I go out and talk to a lot of the young people, that we're going to help you do whatever you want to do. You know what I'm saying? If you want to go out and be a, a professor or a teacher, we're going to help you get into college, help you go to school. If you want to be a thug or a drug dealer, you don't want to work, then we got a place for that too. We got jails and we got officers that will uh, take care of that too. So we're going to help you do whatever you want to do. I just know that uh, I would love to have the opportunity there for them to be able to choose. Right now, that's what's missing. So what are some of the programs that's in place right now for the youth? And maybe what are some of the programs that's going to be for the future for the youth? Well, currently we have um, we have a workforce readiness program that's provided for or administered by the Urban League. And now it's called STYLES. It's a summer program that runs eight weeks or six weeks. And it trains the, 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 the youth, 14 and 16 year old, how to dress, how to talk, how to communicate, how to interview, teaching etiquette teach them uh, good work, uh, work, work skills so they don't know how to work. Most people think if I'm your friend and, and we become friends and I ain't got to work and I just get a check. You're talking about the hookup. Right. And then if you, <laughs> and if you want me to do something, I'm going to say, well, he tripping. He want me to take the garbage out. No. They ain't tripping. <laughs> he paying you to take the garbage out. And if you don't take it out, they're going to pay somebody else. Exactly. So it ain't personal. It's business. But a lot of young people, as you know, have a lot of overturn in their early uh, work, working uh, experience because they have the wrong mindset. You know, they say, he tripped me, he won't be to work. Uh, well, duh. <laughs> That's exactly. what exactly. So it trains them how to uh, go in there, they look out, look you straight in the eye, shake your hand, talk to you, better communicate, how they, they are to, to our benefit and affect your company and help you do better, and that's just helping them do better. So I think, you know, it's tricky from the Bible is this train up the child. You've got to train them up. And these young people, you've been amazed. We had a graduation ceremony yesterday over at the Pinellas uh, Technical Institute, and these young people ran the whole program. I mean, he's talking about 14 to 16 year olds that are headed into high school. So he's a pretty much middle school student. But what it does is a six week program, at the end of that six weeks, the ones that completed get a $500 stipend. They get financial literacy training, which is very important. We've got a lot of people going to these predatory lenders and cashing their checks, and they're thinking, amen, they didn't charge me $10. But $10 yeah. out of 10 weeks is $100, and yeah. it was your money. And when you were out there working, no one came and offered you a cold drink or wiped the sweat off your bra. No, but in 20 God. seconds, you had them $10 yeah. of your check. And if you're making 10 bucks an hour, you just gave them an hour of labor, and you cool with it. you cool with it. It don't make, don't make any sense. So through financial literacy and also the GTE credit union, um, and with, with, Rob, with, with uh, Rob, with the uh, manager over there, we have uh, with Rob Perry, we have uh, he comes in and we teach those kids financial literacy. You know what to do with your money, how to save, how to open an account. You know what I'm saying? They have what they call a youth 22 account through GT Credit Union Midtown. And what that does from youth to the age 22, they'll work with those young people, uh, show them how to save and build a relationship with their bank. So when it comes to time they want to get a car, then they'll be able to uh, get a loan on their own without you co signing. Which is a beautiful thing. Beautiful it's, thing. Yeah, so it's all about training them up. So it's not just, it's, it's almost every aspect of what they're going to need. We invite different speakers in, like myself and other leaders in the community to come in and talk to them and share with them. Yesterday, prior to the, the uh, completion ceremony, they had, we had lunch with them, and the way they set it up was a table with three, it was a table with four settings. They wanted an adult or mentor at each table to sit and talk with them and ask them how they summer was, what they learned. You know, and just and the kids talk back and forth, and it was it was amazing. We had kids that didn't want to be there. Thought this was a waste of time. Those were the those were the uh, uh, those were the um, the ambassadors for the program at the end because they were talking about turnaround, talking about what they're doing. Yeah, the turnaround. That, that was great. But 
That was a little bit of money. It was only thirty-five thousand dollars for fifty kids for that program, but we had about we had hundreds apply. So the harvest is plentiful, but the labor is few. And that's just for the summer. That's just for the summer. Of workforce readiness. Then we go into the summer youth intern program. Okay. Which is sixteen to twenty-one. That program is funded to the tune of a quarter of a million dollars, and we provide uh, ten-week uh, jobs for kids uh, sixteen to twenty-one. And the way that program works is we go out and we find the, the private industry to partner with us and give us, uh, and they'll come in and hire the kid. We'll get the kid at the rate of three sixty four an hour, and we pay the other half of the minimum wage. So you get a kid 10 weeks uh, for up to 30 hours a week or, or more, and um, you just pay three sixty four an hour, and then we pay the other half when we pay the unemployment. So basically what I tell those kids, this is a 10-week job interview, because at the end of that, they possibly can have a full-time employment that would offer them to stay on full-time, and also uh, it benefits the employee because it takes the the um, the cost, the labor cost out of the equation. Also, you got to, it's like on the job training. Kid already knows what to do, or the person already knows what to do. So it behooves you investment for you to keep them on. But now you got to pay a little more, but you got to worry about the job getting done or the quality of the job. So that's pretty good. We have a whole host of different. Um, and boys that participate in that, you know, I'm on the PSCA board. I got them involved. They hired four youth from different departments out there. So uh, Sweet Bay was hiring like uh, 20 at the heyday. And of course, once we lost those stores, they're not hiring as many, but I think they still participate in the program. Um, we got Marriott participating in the program. Um, um, uh, we also have uh, Wynn Reeves with her POPs program, which is a professional uh, opportunity for these young people. They participate and they uh, they get the same thing. We also have kids that participate in different city departments. But we try to uh, I frown on that one because when we do the city departments, we pay the whole amount, we pay the whole wage. So we don't get the two for it. You know what I'm gotcha. saying? Gotcha. And, and, and every for every one kid we have in the city that's one that might not get a job. Because you know, of that quarter of a million dollars, that uh, ten week program, they hire about hundred and twenty kids. We got almost a thousand kids that apply. There so, again, the harvest is plentiful, but the land was a few. So, so it seems to me, um, Mr. Newton, that you're very passionate about what you do. Right. And seems to also get a little background on you. You're a St. Pete native. Yeah, born and raised. Born, born and raised. raised. Right. So you sitting on this city council board is personal for you. Yeah, it's to me. It's um, I mean, you got to look at how I came up. I came from the ghetto, which is behind the hood. People get confused. <laughs> The neighborhood is nice. The ghetto isn't as nice. It's not a lot of opportunities in the ghetto either. either. So you have to do a lot of struggling, a lot of fighting, a lot of crawling. I come from a very large family. It was eight of us. I mean, it was five brothers, three sisters. And we had our mom that was raised as a single mom because dad checked out when I was around eight years old. You know, So you got eight kids in a two-bedroom house off 11th to 11th down from Silver Lake. And uh, it's... Um, it was very difficult. You know, we had a, uh, a two bedroom house and one room my mom slept in the other room was all the kids. They had a bunk bed on one side with, with five kids uh, in the bunk bed, three on the, on the bottom, two on the top. You had a full size bed on this side of the room with my three sisters and then we had a large dresser across the back of the room that had nine drawers and everybody got one and the oldest kid got two. And we were close. And I mean that. <laughs> because just imagine having nine people in the house with one bathroom. Oh wow. Nine, yeah. Jesus help me. Oh, yeah. But you know, everything I'm not, maybe everything, everything that I am, you know, food stamps, government cheese. I always say government cheese, not government cheese, because government cheese melts. <laughs> government cheese don't. Yeah, good, good but, cheese sandwiches <laughs> and get macaroni. Burn the bread up with government cheese, um, food stamps, free lunch, reduced lunch, summertime, that's new jobs you're looking at. Oh, yeah, we but, see. But, but everything I'm not, maybe everything I am, I took full advantage of all those opportunities. That's what I keep installing the young people, the opportunity, not guaranteed. Opportunity. Opportunity. And, and because of that, uh, I was able to break them chains, and now my kids can't work these jobs program because I made too much. So, you know, it's, it's a hand up, not a hand out. So it's nothing for anybody to be ashamed of. And I tell that story because people see me and they go, he got it made, you know. But they don't even know where he came from. Right. And, and a lot of the people, if you talk to any of them, they know about me. They know exactly where I came from. And also, you know, <laughs> um, who inspired you? Who came? Who was in the city council 
position, this seat before he was that inspired you? Well, Renee Flowers was here before me. She had a lot of uh, challenges herself. You don't understand, we represent um, two of the, uh, what they call uh, the minority, majority minority districts, which is, for lack of a uh, better word, uh, the politicians term of areas of greatest need in the city where you probably have a lot of uh, uh, poverty, housing issues, crime, unemployment, those are the areas you represent. But you only got two council people representing those areas, but it takes five votes to get things done. So you got the people in the other areas that, that are immune to what's happening down in your area, then you got a hard sell. You know, I find myself often um, telling my colleagues, you know, when they say, well, I don't know this is gonna work. I say, well, I know it's gonna work. I'm not like carjacking you or home invading you or selling drugs, you know, and they look at me like, <laughs> but it's the truth. It's the truth. I know that for what not for these opportunities, uh, I wouldn't be sitting where I'm sitting at. And I'm standing on the show of giants. What really inspired me was as growing up here in South St. Pete and seeing the area the way it was. And the way it is now, we're in 2013, still talking about areas of greatest need and poverty and housing. And it's, it's depressing. I mean, if you really want to see the, the, the pulse of community, do a, a Meals on Wheels. Get, in, get out there and ride around, volunteer, and do a Meals on Wheels. And look at all the shut in people down on the South end and the way they live, it'll blow you away. Here in 2013, in the fourth largest city in the state, the largest city in the county, you will believe people are living like that. But you have to see it, you know, a lot of people don't, don't do that. But me, that's what I do. I try to uh, look at uh, what, what they're going through. This initially was not my was not my ultimate goal. I was not looking to be in politics. This was an area I was guided to, you know. Um, as you talk about crime and drugs, when I met, met my soulmate, Melissa, we moved out into, um, that it's like the Childs Park area, out of Westminster Heights, and on my street, on my block, it was three crack out. And I was raising four kids, I had three boys and a daughter, and at the time, the neighborhood president was saying, you know, uh, well, I tell people don't drive down Fourth Avenue, and I'm like, well, I got a house on Fourth Avenue, and it's not a mobile home, so I can't pick it up and move it to another area. Also, um, I'm raising four kids, so I had two options, do something, or do nothing. And the second one really wasn't an option. So what happens most of the time is you're in a neighborhood meeting and you stand up and you vocal, you become president. <laughs> I understand. Because they always say, well, you do it. Yeah, yeah. So you have to put up a shut up. So I, I got together uh, with the 34th Street Federation uh, that was up on doing uh, crime marches on 34th Street, Mr. Andy Gar. Um, we got the blessing of, a, of, of an excellent police uh, community police officer and Officer Ward, Michael Ward, because I never, I remember the first day he called me. He says, uh, "Miss Newton, said I'm Officer Ward. I'm 23 and I love drugs." <laughs> he said, uh, "I knew about your problem on Fourth Avenue. I knew about your problem on Third. I'll be to the neighborhood meeting on Saturday, and, and I'll see you then." I was like, "Great, the proactive." <laughs> so yeah, so my prayers have been answered, and, and with that due diligence, we were able to shut down those drug houses, and. Um, and after that happened, this seat became open, and the people were saying, man, you want to run? I said, I don't know. They said, we'll help you, you know. They said, you have the passion, you have the conviction, and, and you'll be great. And, you know, and I, uh, being a, a neighborhood president, I called around and talked to some other neighborhood presidents in different areas. And I never remember Barbara Hawkins. She was the president of Pinellas Point, a great Pinellas Point uh, neighborhood association. And she told me, she said, Newton, she said, whatever you do, she said, be true to your heart. If you don't believe in it, don't do it. And things like that stuck with me. Then I had this old lady that was about 83 years old at my last uh, uh, candidate debate at the Museum of History. Um, we were down there, and um, i never forget it. I was up on the, the stage with my opponent and the rest of the people running for office, and I was making faces with my daughter. I always take my little daughter with me, and I can hear them, but I'm, I got them zoned out, so I'm making faces with her, we drawing stuff and showing it back and forth. And the little lady asked me, she said, she said, I got a question, I got a question for Newton. So I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I want to know that, you know, your demeanor, you seem irate and upset. I want to know what that demeanor, how are you going to do that? How, what are you going to do to work with the man to get things done? And I told her, I said, well, that's a good question. I said, but I'm not irate or upset. I said, I'm pissed off. You know, I said, I, I've been, I was born and raised in South St. Pete. I see the area of, of how things are down there versus how things are in the rest of our allegedly seamless community. And it pains my heart. So I offer myself up to make a difference rather than complain. 
I said, I see your second part of your question, how am I going to be able to work with the mayor? I said, the last time I checked, this is a four-year term. I said, I'm going to be here two years after he's gone. <laughs> you know? So gotcha. we, we got done, and we're in the reception at the, at the end, and she came up to me. She said, uh, she said, she said, new, she said, you, you got an envelope? So I gave one of my campaign donation envelopes. She said, I gave her an envelope. She grabbed my hand. Never forget, she was about maybe about five feet tall. She held my hand, a little cold hand, she shook my hand, and she said, look at me, look at me. She said, don't you ever change. Don't you ever change. So she was sick of her people bobbing their head and going along. She wanted someone that was going to come in and advocate for the people. And that thing, um, government by the people, for the people, just stuck. So, so that's what you stand up. That's what I've been doing. If you look at my record, I've mean, been a lot of seven to one votes. And people ask me, you always vote no. I said, well, um, if I can't believe in it, I'm not, not going to vote to support it. And that's where that passion come in. Right. Because you understand that you're not just voting for yourself. you got family here. Right. We're not just family. You know, to whom much is given, much is expected. And you're looking at, uh, it's a whole city here. It's depending on you it's to be the voice for the voiceless. And so if I don't stand up for the move, we don't. I mean, unanimous votes are great, but who's going to look out for the people? You know what I'm saying? I mean, and, and, and that's the problem. Everybody thinks you should be going along and getting along and all that. That's great in a perfect world. But when you live in where I'm living, coming from where I'm from, and you see the problems that are happening, you just can't smile and go along. I mean, you're doing the people a grave injustice. If you're going to do that, you shouldn't be sipping the seat. Uh, you should go find out something else to do. It's simple as that. This is not for the uh, timid or faint at heart. I mean, you know. Does it bother me? Yes, but I can sleep at night. You know, this peer thing, I mean, it was huge, but I realized when, we, when I read my book, The Bobbins, and I keep it right here, because I'm, I'm going to be reminded of it. And everybody come in, I show them this. And it says, uh, uh, it says right here, the you know, The Bobbins, it says, uh, I went in the Usami Square to then affirm that I'm a citizen of St. Petersburg, Florida. In the United States of America, that as an officer of the city of St. Petersburg and a recipient of public funds. So, what that means is I don't just receive money from um, District 7, I get public funds from the whole city. So, by virtue of that, I'm a St. Petersburg city councilman. District 7 is what I just happen to represent. Then it says, <clears throat> I will support, protect, uphold, and defend the Constitution of these United States of America in Florida, that I am duly qualified to hold office under the city charter and the Constitution, uh, Constitution of the state and will faithfully perform my duties as office as councilman of District 7 in the city of St. Pete, uh, on which uh, I am now, uh, on the office for which now I'm about to enter. So when I read that, it tells me that, you know, I'm a, we're stewards of the taxpayers' money and resources. We don't own none of this. This power was lent to us, and that when it, this time is over, this power returned back to the people. So I don't own any of this stuff, and as a peer concern, that's not mine. It belongs to the people. So the people should vote on that if we're talking about tearing it down or getting rid of it. something that is iconic and historic. So um, I'm cool with that. If the people vote to tear it down, I'll try to vote those. I'm not against new development, you know. But I just want them to be uh, um, in there and have a say. They're the ones that put me here. I mean, I was not elevated to God status, so I don't see all and know all. So I got to depend on them to have their input. And a lot of people say, well, we shouldn't take everything to the voters, they're uneducated. Well, the uneducated voters put me here. So, you so I got a little bit of faith in them, you know. I, I think they made a good choice. Uh, the, another program I want to touch on with you before I got, before I hit with that one was, it's very critical, was the, the after school jobs program. Now, I was able to get $100,000 set aside for that program. I have a lot of my colleagues told me, this is one time money, so they all turned on to fund it once. What that does is, <clears throat> when the summer jobs roll down, you can already enroll to have an after school job. And statistics have shown that the majority of you think something either happened to them when they get into something between hours of three and six. So if you got a couple of few hours they can work out of school, then that'll keep them away from that. You know, and I remember my first after school job, my check was forty three dollars because it was mine. It was your Popo wasn't chasing me. I had a sense of um self pride uh, self pride and a sense of worth because I was able to earn some money. And that was important. That one is crucially important because on June 6th, the uh, police chief came in on a quarterly report, like I just told you about, and he informed council that since from June 6th to uh, 2013 to December 2012, the past seven months, they've arrested 1,150 juveniles in the city of St. Pete. That's bad. That's a lot of kids. That's a lot of rate. And if you divide that by seven, 
which is seven months, that's 165 kids, each and every one without fail. Now that's the school year. We ain't even got to the summer yet. See what I'm saying? Everybody talking about summer jobs and summer opportunities. That's the school year, so I'm not sure. But the after school job thing is more damning because I think that giving those kids the opportunity, you'll be able to turn a lot of them away from that. Even as we talk to our police chief about our sworn spread, 545 officers. Okay, and they're looking to add five more. Budget over $92 million. We have less than $400,000 set aside for job opportunities for these young people. And I asked the chief, as it pertains to our full strength of the officers that we put on the street to keep you, me, and us safe, how much of their time is spent as it pertains to dealing with juvenile, a juvenile issue? And he tells me 30 to 40 percent. That's a lot of time. A lot of time. So if you provide money to give opportunities to these young kids, Police ain't gonna deal with them. This ain't rocket science. No, not you won't need ninety-two million dollars. You won't keep need, need that police. They can be doing real police work, like solving some of these unsolved murders. Yes, and, you know. I mean, there's a lot they can do. But right now, what we have in place is politics. We have a PBA that uh, that asks us every candidate a questionnaire: Would you support this? Would you expand the Chase Positive? Would you expand the Take Home Car Program, which is ludicrous because that's a million dollars. But you can be able to drive back and forth to work, courtesy of the taxpayers. And that's that's a lot of money, especially when you look at that. We don't even have enough money set aside for job opportunities for these young people. I, every year I advocate and fight for a million dollars in um, for jobs programs for the kids and it falls on deaf ears. But you can tell anything by administration about the commitment they have to the young people. And when you got numbers like the chief telling you that oh, almost half of my office of time is spent dealing with juveniles, you would look at ways to find more things for those juveniles to do. And if you do that, they'll graduate high school. They'll go off and do better. They'll be an asset to the community, not a detriment. But what we have here is a whole underground system by which the kids are worth more if they don't graduate. They don't go off to college or whatever. This industry, this child uh, prison bed industry, is a $185 million a year industry. So they want to trap them in the system. Uh, they are not want to, they're trapping them. I told you about the 1150. The city of St. Pete contributes to roughly around 1,800 juveniles to the juvenile justice system every year. That's the city of St. Pete. But countywide, it's 8,000 juveniles. It's a major assault on the village. And we're out here now with our stuff, our trappings, and, and, and getting on with our status, and we're not really realizing what's happening. You know, the Bible says, train up a child. They didn't say a black child, they didn't say a white child, they didn't say your child or my child. It's trying to print up a child on the way it go. And I always pondered that, what did they mean by a child? That a child is telling you to protect that village. You got to by any means necessary. Because if you don't look out for these kids, it's over. I mean, we, when we come, that's going to be it, you know. Now that I'm getting older, I'm going to some of my classmates and friends' funerals. And as I walk down these long hallways, and here into these caskets, I don't see the cars and the house and all the stuff. So it reminds me that you come in this world with nothing. You're going to leave with nothing. And that follows me up to my, my final question to you. At the end of your legacy, the end of everything that you have done, what do you want to be remembered for? My, I want to be remembered for uh, at least being the person that sparked the young mind that was going to keep this thing going. That was going to advocate and fight for these young people. I mean, it's, that's pretty much what it is. I tell everybody, my image is, is these kids. You know, somebody made sure I got that welfare, somebody made sure I got that government cheese, and that free lunch, that reduced lunch. I don't know who it was, but they made sure it was there. But what I know now, those things are not there. All those things are there to be available to get the kids an opportunity. And when you got drugs as your number one employee in South of Central, you got a serious problem in this city. And as elected officials, we can not stick our head in the sand and just say, well, I did all I could, you know. I'm going to run and yell it from the mountain because I do believe to whom much is given, much is expected. You know, my mom is my biggest uh, 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 admiration. I mean, she had a massive heart attack that killed her in 1985 at the age of 47, raising eight kids she didn't get by herself. So I know that um, if you don't have these opportunities here, it's going to be really hard on these kids. I'd love to tell you in a perfect world that all my brothers and sisters are doing great and everybody went off and and went to college and I'd be lying. You know, but I do know given the opportunity, we can uh, uh, prevail. I know and I believe that God has already sent us a Savior.
these young people are the critical thinkers. These are the ones that's going to cure cancer, diabetes, heart disease, Parkinson. You know, all time, if given the opportunity, we can't just lock them up for all these crazy reasons and, and hope that everything's going to be all right. You know, we, we formed the Manila's uh, Juvenile Justice Coalition. And we meet, we're going to be here uh, Thursday, April 1st. We meet more when it's, uh, I'm sorry, Thursday, August 1st. But we meet more when, when the, um, when um, the session is going on, what we do is go up and advocate for any laws that are detrimental to these young people. You know, the state attorney, Mr. Bernie McCabe, have told me that he's a counsel, he said, all I got is a law. That's all I got. And I'm the state attorney, so my job is to enforce the law. That's what I do, that's my job. He said, now if you don't like that law, you need to go to Tallahassee and change the law. And that's the same thing that happened to Mr. Trayvon Martin and his family. It was the law. It was the laws, these crazy laws that were passed to 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 um to to really um I, I guess let people do do the things that they do. I mean, right now the police couldn't bother you at all unless they were, you were breaking a law. See, and that the people really get engaged and educated and go vote, they control who they send up to town and that makes these laws. That's number one. Number two, if they're voting, they get included in the jury pool. So they'll be able to get to be called in some of these cases and stop trying to run from jury duty. I mean, don't Monday money quarterback and you go sit in that room. You go look at that evidence. You go hold the line. You know, that's, that's something small you can do. That's your civic duty. That's something small you can do. You ain't got to run for office or nothing. But when called to do your duty, you should do that. A lot of people don't want to do that. I don't want to go. I try to get out of jury duty. Uh, well, it was six people there. It was a jury and the law that let this in the go. That's all that was. You can make whoever you want. It was the law and the jury. Period. That's all it was. So, but I do uh, appreciate you giving me the opportunity to interview with you. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can see. My legacy. I just really want to know that I've done all I can, while I can, to help who I can. I do believe you get everything out of life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. And right now, it's a major assault on these young people. So I want to leave it better than which I found out. I love for them to have at least some remnants of the job opportunities and opportunities that I had to try to help them say no to drugs, say no to drug selling, and stay in school and graduate, you know. And, and that's that's all the other thing. That was my whole hidden agenda. It wasn't for me to go anywhere and do anything. It was just, I think God sent me this way to do just what I'm doing, to try to advocate for these kids and, and do it to the best of my ability. So, I mean, that's what I'm doing. So. If I've done that well, when I'm done with this, maybe I'll get blessed with something else. But if not, I've done what the Lord asked me to do, and I'm, I'm cool with that. So, but we just got to know that we have got to look out for the least of these. And right now, it's those babies. And, and I know we don't think that, but I got black and white numbers to back it up. You know, he taught us how to read, and we read. So you see what's really happening, the root cause of what these young people are going. And, and lastly, what's more damning is, Florida is the only state that relates with juvenile records. So the stuff these kids are doing now in their young age, the fun stuff that they're doing, is going to come back to hunt them as adults. Because that's it on the PSTA board, that's it on temporary regional planning, and the work net board. On the work net board, most of these employees now require a clean background. And even the job programs that I told you about, if these young people have records, they need not apply. It's catch-22. I mean, the saddest thing I've heard is one of our program administrators, Mr. Watson A, said, and some of you have read this work, work, work training program, that he had to sit across the table from a 14-year-old boy and tell him, you know, because you got a background, I can't offer you an opportunity. So what do you think he's going to do? He's going to go, go be a lookout for a dope man. He's going to find a way. I mean, he wants some joints. He wants some stuff. You know, he's going to find a way. All they want to do is work. You know, they don't want to deal drugs. They don't want to do crime. But if the jobs aren't there, if the opportunities aren't there, then how are we gonna follow them? And I'm telling you, loading up on police is not there, that ain't gonna solve it. We ain't got enough money. Each officer, put one officer on the street, costs us $100,000. That's the car, Kevlar, Taser, Glock, uh, the salary, pension, $100,000 per, just put one of them on the street. And we got less than money, we got less money than, than it requires for four officers committed to these young people. And the job opportunities that we offer up was 40 jobs in an um, after school job program, 120 in summers, that's 160, another 50 in um, 
in the uh, workforce readiness program, so that's 210, and 20 in the year-round program, JWD. So we offer 230 job opportunities for young people. We're we'll locking up 165 a month. We do that. You know, it's not designed for the young people. I mean, it's 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 a it's a hell of a tie to turn. But I hope my hopefully my my uh, legacy is that I put a big enough bit into that. But if I can't, I'm definitely gonna pull the curtain back and show everybody the public house and let them know what's happening. Everywhere I go, that's all I speak about. Some people get sick of hearing about it, but that's what God has placed on my heart. If I didn't tell you what was going on, then I'll be dedicating my duty. But I know knowledge is power, and I you know. So. I appreciate you taking time out of your day and sitting down with Fred Hickey of the Fred Hickey Show. This is City Council District 7, William yeah. Newton. Yeah. As you can see, he has a passion and a heart for young people. All I can do is think about Whitney Houston's song right now that the children are our future. Yes. And that's what City Council Wayne, Wayne Wingate Newton believes. So once again, this is Fred Hinton of the Fred Hinton Show. Thank you for tuning in. God loves you. He has a plan for your life. Bye. Every time searching for a hero, people need